record this for the folks who aren't here. Sorry for the late recording. All right, talk to me about the normality of this. Would it be normal? Or how could we check? Right on. Right on. And I'm very, very confident. This one's 60. This is 240. So I'm very comfortable saying that those two values are greater than or equal to 10. And I can assume this curve is a normal curve. And then my standard deviation of all these p hats would be the square root of 0 0.8 times 0 0.2 all divided by 300. Is that what the rest of you guys got? It was 0 0.02 for you, more like it. Yeah. Did, was your 300 underneath your square root sign? You haven't taken the square root yet. Take the square root. Because it's the square root of all of that. Is it 0 0.02? Yeah. That is key. 0 0.023, is that what it was, Alistair? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cool. All right. So first I wanted to review the basic premise of these sampling distributions. Now, in a few minutes, we are going to use p hats to make estimates about p. In other words, what if I didn't tell you that it was 80% of people who like Buckeyes, who, uh, of Columbusites that you like the Buckeyes? Wait. That, that felt like it didn't connect right, like my brain to my mouth. Guess how many there are? But what we would do is we would take our sample, right? So like, so far, all these questions I've given you, I've told you what the proportion of the population is, except for the whole point of learning all this stuff is that we don't know that percent of the population. We have to somehow use a sample to get there. Does that make sense? So we're going to be working backwards from some of these ideas. Everybody good? All right. Before we do that, I want, to take, I want us to take a different unknown thing. And so I just want to talk about the basic structures of estimation. So you guys, what I'd like you to do on your paper is write down your estimate for the age of Mr. Belk. How old do you think he is? I'm pretty sure he is too. I know that they're young. Just write down your estimate. I don't want your estimate influencing anybody else's. Just write it down. I think I know his age. Wait, he's unnatural? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I, guess I, I mean, Does everybody have your guess? Stop. Hey, stop. Does everybody have their guess? Your own guess? How many of you? Oh, should I make a guess? Yeah. Wait, but don't you know his age? I do, but I don't remember. So I have a very good ballpark of his age. I just heard him. All right. 
you guys. How do you feel about your estimate? Good. Pretty decent. Are you asking that how old you are? I feel like too many of you already know how old I am. No, I, I don't get insulted by it. One, you guys, if I were in the room, your estimates would probably be a year to a year and a half lower than what you actually think. I'm just in like mid-40s, mid-to-late-40s. I'm saying 39. I'm sticking with 30 now. Like, 41. Okay, I'm just saying I'm pretty young. I used to get underestimated all the time until about the past three years, and now it's my age is starting to show. Did he just say I reminded him of his grandma? Yeah, but like she's the lady who's like. Yeah, but just talk to his grandma. Right on, right on. Age is just a state of mind, anyway, guys. Okay, so um, I'm not 39, Jeffrey, but thank you. I don't think I could have been teaching for 20 years and be 21 years old. Yes, you could have just been yeah. very good. If it's helpful, this is my 20th year teaching. Like mid-40s. Mid low 40s. Uh, it, well, I don't know. What is the boundary between mid and low 40s? I think uh, mid 40, is like 43 to 40s. Uh, 44 to 46 is mid, probably. Yeah. I'd say 40, oh, yeah, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, I would say 44 to like 47. Cool. Then I'm definitely in my lower 40s, guys. 42. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're, it's like that one number from the answer the universe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The mean, <laughs> that means my age is the meaning of life, y'all. Okay. All right. Now, how about this? I'm going to tell you right now that Mr. Belk is older than me. So... How do you feel about your estimate? Pretty good. I disagree now. You disagree now? With my estimate. Yeah. So I probably disagree with most of your estimates too. All right. So I'm going to say how I feel is questionable, even though I know. This was, uh, I do this activity every year, and every year I have to go back and ask the person how old they are, because even though they tell me before I run the activity, I don't write it down, and then I'm... You know, um, so what if when you made that estimate, you were like, I know my estimate isn't going to be perfect. I want to give myself some wiggle room. Okay. So what if we gave each other a plus or minus two years? So all of a sudden my 41 plus or minus two years becomes uh, 39 to 43. You should keep your same number. How many of you feel better about your estimate now that you included this plus or minus two years? And what would it mean for your estimate to be right? Should I put Mr. Belk on speakerphone? Yeah. 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 Do you think it's gonna flip him out if I call him and like he's gonna think there's an emergency? You should FaceTime him. That's all right. <laughs> Actually, send him a text and like call me ASAP. It's an important period at the end. And <laughs> then just don't respond. <laughs> That's not my jam. No, you should be like. Are you one of? should come up to my classroom. Griffin does that all the time. Are you one of a preserved type of person? <laughs> Any chance you can stop past my classroom, comma? My class has a question for you. Question marks. All right. Now, you guys, we're going to do a several different um, wiggle rooms here, okay? So what if instead we did 41 plus or minus five years? My interval then becomes between 36 and 46. How do you guys feel about that? Good. How do you feel about your interval right now? Very good. Not good. You still don't feel good? 
No, I, uh, well, maybe the upper end, but I don't think there's any way that Mr. Belk is 34 years old. So an interesting thing is when we do this interval, we're just trying to guess somewhere a range of values that includes his actual age. Yeah? Also, you said he was older than you, and since you're somewhere around, like, 42. I'm almost 42.5 years old. Since you're only, like, 42. Actually, what's today's date? I think 44. Today's the 23rd. It's my third birth. It's my third birthday. Quarter birthday? Wait. Third birthday. Your birthday is on this date in the month. November, December, January, February. It's my one third. It's I'm I'm. What is today the twenty third? Yes. I am forty two and one third years old today. Yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. You guys, he's in a meeting and. Should we just like go down to the meeting? No. No, the meeting, he's, he's told me what meeting he's in. It's one I don't want to interrupt. Can we ask Mr. Wyan? I know. Oh, I do know Mr. Wyan's age. Do you guys want to switch this to Mr. Wyan? I think yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Belkin. Yeah, change your estimate to... Wyan's definitely 41. No, no, no. Because I feel like mine was too young. Because I'm thinking... 35. Mr. Wyan, I think, is way harder to guess than Mr. Belk. All right, so my guess for Mr. Wyan is 36. I know, but this, so like for both of these, I wrote down my guess before I spoke with them because I don't think it's fair to cheat you guys. So, so my Y on interval would be 34 to 38. And my Belk interval, and for, 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 this would be 31 to 41. Is Mr. Y one of those people that looks a lot younger than he is? No, I don't know. He is an, a singular infant. Yeah. I saw him on my pediatrician. I didn't know how many kids he had. He has. I don't know if she's an infant, but she's really tiny. Okay. Are we ready? How are you guys feeling about your intervals right now? Here's what I'm going to tell you on Miss Meister's intervals. Three of the four of them are good. All right. So the ones that I wrote in black are my intervals for Mr. Belk. The ones that I wrote in blue are my intervals for Mr. Wyan. Okay? I like this one. I like this one. And I like this one. Me knowing the answers now. So, let's do one more set of intervals for both guys. This time, plus or minus 20 years. So, that would make my estimate for Mr. Belk somewhere between 21 to 61. <laughs> and my interval for Wyon to be 16 to 56. I feel like that's a good guess between 16 and 56, like... All right, you guys, can you tell me what is wrong with those last two intervals? Yeah, no, no, I love this answer. They're not helpful. Why might we want to know, who might want to know somebody's age? Uh, so you know how to talk to them because you probably don't want to hire a 16-year-old as an assistant principal. Oh, for sure, for sure, we wouldn't want to hire a 16-year-old. Usually, though, you put, like, your age, you put your, like, college graduation year and all that kind of stuff on your resume, so that's not usually an issue, okay? But, like, outside of the school world, can you think of reasons we might want to be able to estimate somebody's age? Um, if you're selling them a product that you need to be, like, a certain age for? Sure, like cough syrup or something like that, so I'm sure what you're referencing, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think your age matters. 
I think it's even more insurance. Yeah, insurance would definitely want to know something about different ages. Yeah? Uh, you can use it for marketing. For sure. Different age groups buy different stuff. So. You guys, do you think... Do you think that uh, if somebody was trying to sell something, they would use the same tactic with you guys as they use with me? Yes. Probably not. Do you guys catch my drift? Yes. Okay. So estimating somebody's age, yeah, I feel very confident that both of these in intervals <laughs> are quote unquote right, that they actually have the actual age in them, but they're still not very useful intervals. Does this make sense so far? So, when we think through what we're going to do, we want to make sure that as we, um, as we develop our estimates, the estimate is always going to be the easy part. Okay? How hard was it for you guys to come up with your guess? Not very good. The margin of error, well, I gave them to you, but the margin of error plays that we have this lovely balancing act for margin of error because we want, the, we want to be right, right? Like I told you, I like three of these intervals. I don't like this one because his actual age isn't inside this interval, right? So we want our interval to be quote unquote correct. It has to capture that true value, okay? So we want it wide enough that we're, most, that we're very likely to capture that true value. But once it gets too wide, it stops being informative. So the process we're about to learn is the exact same um, process as what they do for political polling. So like say I wanted to estimate the percentage of people who were going to vote for a certain issue on the November ballot. right? They take, this, they take a sample, they measure the percent of that sample, and let's go ahead and say that I did something, took my sample in such a way that my margin of error was 40%. You guys, a 40% margin of error doesn't tell anybody anything. Even a 20%, even a 5% margin of error is not ideal. Do you guys see what I'm saying here? So we spend, um, as we go through and we do these interval estimates, which is what we're jumping into next, keep in mind that the whole time in the real practice of this, People balance the, I want to be right, with, so that my interval actually hits the true value. And uh, I don't want it to be so wide that it becomes unuseful. Everybody good? So just so you know, Mr. Belk's real age is 42. And Mr. Wyan's real age is 39. I think Mr. Wyan's hair makes people underestimate his age. Smile. And he's always smiling. He's got a lot of energy. Yeah. All right, y'all. So if we are trying to make an, a statistical estimate, we do our estimate plus or minus a margin of error. The goal of today is to help you guys work through how do I find that margin of error. And like there is like math reasoning processes behind margin of error. Everybody good? All right. So Okay, relatively reasonable thing to consider. Ms. Meister's trying to estimate what proportion of students plan on attending the musical. Guys, go see it. It's going to be awesome. I don't think I will. You don't think you will? No. I wasn't really planning on going either. I actually don't know how much of it I'll see because I'll be backstage for a lot of it. But like? Next weekend. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Is the set good? It's the set? Yeah. yeah. So, you guys, if I ask a if I ask a sample of students whether or not they plan on seeing the show, and of my sample, I asked fifty students, 
And I find that 29 say they're planning on seeing the show. Everybody good? So we call it a point estimate in the sense that we're going to, we, our estimate is always a singular number. And if I'm trying to estimate what percent of students are going to go see the show, what's my best guess? Yeah. Uh, take a sample and see how many are going. I did. The, the 50 and the 29. So this is before sales, yes? This is what percent plan to go see the show. You have a good point there. Which would, in fact, be 0.58 or 58%. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's my best estimate. And that is a P hat because it is a percent or a proportion of a sample. All right. So what if I just say, hey, I took my sample, but now I need to give myself that wiggle room because... That 58% came from a sample, right? And what do we know about samples? Samples are not perfect. So I'm going to take that 0.58, and I'm going to give myself plus or minus 7%. What does that make my interval? What's the lower end? 0.51. And the upper end would be? 0.65. And if I ask you what does that really mean, what that basically means is What do you guys think? Does this make kind of some sense? Yes. All right. Can I then say more than half of the students? Yes. Why? 51 is more than half. Okay. I'm going to say it slightly differently. The entire interval is more than 50%. All right, here's a different interval. For the proportion of students who have taken some form of statistics, whether that be FST or AP, How'd you get there? I found the, the middle of the two points. I'm not 100% comfortable with it being 0 0.81. I got 0 0.86. And... 0 0.86 I would buy. So here's what we could do. It's essentially going to be the midpoint between these two values, yes? So average, so average them together.
Yeah. Okay, what was my margin of error? 12 percent. 12%. How'd you get that? Cool. So, can we say that more than three fourths? No. Why not? Because it's below three fourths. When you say it. The lowest interval is. Yeah, I'm just going to say any is because part of the interval is below 75%. How are we feeling so far? Pretty good. All right, so let's develop the couple of students. Okay? So how we really do a margin of error. All right. All right. So, as I read through this, Mr. Stork is trying to estimate the percentage of Grandview students who completed a bachelor's degree or more after high school. He contacts 100 alumni from the past 10 years and has simply found that 62 had completed their bachelor's degree. Okay? So, are you guys with me? Let's go right through that we know that N is equal to 100. Hold on, that 62, is that describing the population or his sample? sample? That's his sample. So what we would have is that P hat is equal to 0.62. Now, the center of those P hats was P. So do we know the center of all the P hats? No, because no, we don't know P. So I'm going to draw a picture here. I know the center is P, and we know our P hat is 0.62, but that this P hat could be here, it could be here, it could be here, it could be here. We don't know where our P hat is relative to P, but we know it's somewhere on this graph. Everybody good so far? All right. So, turns out P hat is a really good estimator for P. So when it comes to formulas and stuff, we're allowed to use P hat in the place of P. So I can do 100 times that 0.62 and 100 times 0.38. I could use those answers, even though it's technically supposed to be 100 times whatever P is, we're going to use p hat in the place of p. And when it's in a formula, the rest of the formula kind of works itself out that that p hat isn't perfect, but we know it's close enough. Okay? So this is 62, 38. Those are greater than or equal to 10. Are you guys comfortable if I draw this as a normal curve? And if I wanted to estimate the standard deviation of those p hats, and again, this is the minute I'm using p hat as my estimator, it's an estimate for sure. Okay. I sure would love some help on this calculator wise. Yeah. I'm going to call that 0 0.049. Sometimes uh, you put the like, number 
first in parentheses, um, and like the first number not in parentheses, does it matter? Okay. Okay. And this is when it's going to start feeling a little bit funky. Okay. All right. Does anybody remember the very, very first thing we learned about when we did normal distributions? Before we learned any of the stuff on the calculator, it was well before, it's not in this notes packet, man. It was in like the second day, second week of school or something. Something like when we went like, one standard deviation from the mean, there was like a certain percentage, and then two standard deviations from the mean. I do remember that. Okay. And it turns out that the name of that rule was the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. That's a very catchy name. Sometimes called the empirical rule. All right. So... If I get this p hat, are you guys with me that that p hat's really close to p? So if I do a margin of error to this one, like this, my interval is going to contain that p, yeah? It'd be somewhere there. And same here, right? If I do that margin of error, it contains p. Everybody good? And um, I'm going to kind of do this and this. And I'm going to call this distance, you guys, 0 0.098 and 0 0.098, which is two standard deviations. 68, 95. Are you with me that this is 95% of our P hats? All right. So if I choose this P hat, this new one right here, here's my margin of error, and I'm going to apply it. Does it contain P? Mm -hmm. Sure does. And this one? It contains P. Do you guys catch my drift here? Okay. What about this one? So if I use this as my margin of error, it doesn't contain P. P is outside the interval. Is everybody with me? All right. So are you guys with me that 95, we could take this picture and turn it into 95% of the P hats are within two standard deviations of P. Cool? And if that's the case, if we want to be right 95% of the time, what should we use as our margin of error? Two standard deviations. Which in this case is that point zero nine eight. So Let's go back to if I'm using 0 0.098 as my margin of error, and our so our remember we do estimate plus or minus our margin of error, and our estimate is just going to be p hat, yes, because that's our best estimate at the percent of the population. So I'm going to do 0.62 plus or minus the 0 0.098.
Someone should check my arithmetic here. I'm pretty confident on the top half. It's the bottom half that is. Okay. All right, so guys, can Mr. Stork say that if this, if this sample actually happened, which it didn't, more than half of Grandview students finish a four-year degree within ten, 10 years? Something like that, yeah. Everybody good? We see the basic premise of this? All right. Um, there will be Yeah, kind of we did. So basic idea is if we know what P is, like we're trying to figure out this value from one of these ones, right? And we said, if we want to be right 95% of the time, pretty decent success rate, okay, where our interval contains that true value, well, we know that P is within two standard deviations of 95% of those P hats. Is everybody with me? So if, we're going to, if we want to be right 95% of the time, we could use two standard deviations for as our margin of error. And then somewhere in the interval, there will be P, the, the actual value we're trying to find. So our typical rule of thumb, until tomorrow anyway, is that